Hello, everyone, and welcome to This Week in Hospitality Marketing Live show number 430. I am your host, Lauren Gray. Thank you so much for joining us live. If you watch this recorded, thank you for joining us on the re-recorded broadcast, which usually are 12, or excuse me, 11.30 a.m. Wednesday, Sydney, Australian time, 11.30 a.m. London, UK time on Wednesday as well, so that we get everybody in our APAC, EU, and Mideast friends to uh, be able to catch it at a more reasonable time. But even still, so many of you join us live from around the world. Uh, we're broadcast live on our TV channel, um, hospitality channel, actually, uh, to 209 countries. And uh, we also simulcast this on uh, several Facebook pages, several YouTube channels, uh, LinkedIn, only one, which is my profile page, Lauren Gray. Um, and then uh, we also do Twitch uh, for our game center console, people that use media consumption there. And we also have it on X, a uh, live broadcast on what was formerly Twitter. And I'm thinking we're missing anything else. I think we've uh, covered all that kind of covered there. So anyway, so as many places as we can possibly believe. Plus also we do our live, uh, excuse me, our live, our recorded audio cast, which has a bit of a recap of the show on our podcast channels, which there are 39 podcast channels that we are on. We are currently in also 39 countries, which is a weird match of numbers. Um, we re-translate uh, that into 11 languages. And then, of course, our radio station, hospitalityradio.com, where we broadcast not only our podcast, but other people's podcasts related to industry data. And as I mentioned before, our TV station. With all of that broadcast, hopefully the information that we provide is helpful and useful, which explains why we have so many people following us today or listening to us today. Um, I did promise that we would get other co-hosts with us back again. We've kind of gotten out of that cycle for a very long period of time uh, since we were very task-driven, single topic-driven, and so forth. And I really wanted to kind of focus in on our discussions of usabilities and functionalities because of our uh, Hospitality Marketing Club, which is a peer-level group of hospitality marketers that you can join at hospitalitymarketing.club, um, where we come up with topics that we want to get out in front with people said, so hopefully it helps people understand some of the changing concepts with marketing strategies for hospitality. Yes, we are unique as an industry, but we also have a lot of similarities to other industries as it comes to the tools that we all have to use, but the modalities are different. One case today in particular is exactly to that point for the context of what we use, what we can use it for. So our topic today, uh, as long as it, we can focus on the not ramble off onto tangents, which is a bane of mine, I guess, and that is using channel cancellation data to boost top line revenue. Ooh, sexy. Um, <laughs> it is a great your conversation, but one that I think gets ignored, uh, at least in context, and also, too, just out of usability. Um, as we all know in this industry, uh, for those who have to handle these types of things, especially data metrics driven kind of information, GA4 has become a common phrase in our vernacular since July 1st when it was told that that is the point of truth platform for Google's analytics services. As we've mentioned before in the show many times, that GA4 is less of an analytics platform and more of a uh, customer audience generator identifier. And that the analytics are, are uh, related to uh, using the data. But it's, it's very different than how UA4, or UA3 uh, was used. It's very different on usabilities as to the data that can be gleaned from it because now we're tracking everything. As a quick recap to GA4 in comparison to UA Universal Analytics prior to it, UA, you had to designate what it is you wanted to follow through the tracking process for it to even tell you what it is data-wise. So you had to say, I want people to I want to track people that do this, 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 and this. And it would follow exactly that, but it would, on, it would only follow that. It wouldn't necessarily show you other data of other engagements. In a very simple description, GA4 literally tracks everything, and then you define what it is out of that data that you're wanting to understand or look at differently. The only Similarity between UA and GA4 is that when you create custom audiences, or in this case, segmentations, as they're now called, they only begin to accumulate once you've created them. The difference, which is a huge difference, is the ability to look backwards in data for newer questions without going, dang, now we got to start the, the, the tracking. And then from now forward, we have to figure out what data is being given to us. Now we can go over and say, oh, you know, I always wondered if X uh, correlated with Y, uh, what was the intercept for Z? And you can look back at older data now and actually put that together and come up with the data. That makes it very unique. The Looker Studio, which is Google's version of the data studio uh, to help customize your data, has very, been very useful in that. Now, here's where it gets fun for today's conversation. In hospitality, we have cancellations. 
<gasps> yes. Uh, that is where somebody booked and, of course, canceled. And there is a plethora of reasons why. Um, uh, some are regrettably unfortunate, changing plans, of course, or tragedies or la loss of travel opportunities or whatever. And others are just playing the field. A lot of people will book a variety of reservations to simply grab and hold what they saw and buys them time with our cancellation policies to come back and see if it's still the best deal that they would like to have. We've accepted this as a necessary evil. Some channels are more used for that than others, OTA in particular. Uh, while others are used less than that, which are more the defined, this is what I've chosen, this is why I've booked, and those usually go direct to the property management system, you know, call to the hotel kind of thing, walk-in kind of thing. Those ones are a little bit more uh, concrete in their bookings and lack of cancellations. Very few of those happen percentage-wise compared to the other channels. In case you're, I'm using jargon that is not well understood by everyone, if you're catching this on a new scale being introduced to some of these cha channels are... The source of where we derive our revenue from. Channels can be direct channel, which is your website. It could be a contract, which is called a local negotiated contract with people that book through their contract that you provide them, a local business that you've given them a special rate for. Uh, you have consortias and wholesalers, and those are negotiated rates for volumes of perpetual traffic that they've said that they would book a certain amount with you for, for a uh, more favorable rate for giving that opportunity. Then you have OTAs, which are online travel agencies like Expedia, Hotel.com, so forth and so on, kayaks and what have you. And those are agri uh, those are services that will have access to your inventory and sell it at the negotiated rate that you give them. Uh, usually it's at your best rate. And then you pay a commission for whatever they produce. So the burden of production is on them and you pay for what they produce. So now that I've described some of the terminology again with all of this, we work with some very large numbers. Let's just kind of look at, in general, your website. So if you have a 3% conversion, that means, in just simplistic Captain Obvious terms, 97% of the engagement to your website did not produce anything. Now, we've had other shows talking about how to address those numbers, that how to maybe change that perspective that you actually can improve the conversion of the non-converted uh, by putting them in an engagement funnel. That allows them to maybe they didn't engage with you on this particular channel through your website, but perhaps through a social media channel or a different means of, of offer, changing what they're thinking and considering for conversion, so forth and so on. And that can be tailored to the dates they were looking for, um, what they looked at on your website. All these segmented audiences that you can create are very powerful in saying, well, you did look at my King uh, Ocean View rooms for December. So let me make an audience segment out of that and let's make an ad set of highlighting those two aspects and maybe either creating an incentive or finding more ways to get in front of them as they may be possibly comparing us to other uh, choices. That's a market strategy we've already discussed. I'm here to talk about the cancellations that we handle. With this ability now to look at a massive stream of data uh, in the tools that we have, um, we have the means to garner data from what used to be unlikely scenarios. Uh, our booking engine is one of them. Now, we were very pleasantly surprised recently that um, our analytics, our GA4 tracking for our clients in general, um, we always had an assumptive value as to how much data got lost. What do I mean by lost? Well, with the ad blockers that are in, in the world now, the iOS 17 uh, restrictions as to the durability of of tracking and the even the allowance of tracking, even analytics tracking, and of course the permissions-based tracking, where it says um, uh, the the um, ability to actually get any information at all uh, is restricted, or you know, you choose to say I don't want anything tracked. We would figure that we were getting a large or percentage of people that we weren't getting information on. So out of the hundred people that came to our website, we thought that maybe. 30, maybe even as upwards of 40 of them, uh, we wouldn't get information on. We would only get 60% or 60 of the 100 people that we'd actually have information related to what they did while they're on our website. We were pleasantly surprised uh, by getting our hard point of truth data, which is our PMS system, that uh, our, our, excuse me, our under online booking engine, excuse me, to be accurate, uh, that, that was a much smaller figure. 
Uh, so a lot of our analytics data that we were receiving in our GA form was actually very close to all the data that was available. And that was a very pleasant surprise because then that meant we didn't have to do statistical inference. It also meant that we didn't have to you know, uh, basically imply that certain values existed for all the unknowns as well. We, we can identify for the knowns, but we would imply that they were, uh, that they were uh, towards the unknowns as well. And so with that, this strategy became a little bit more interesting. And what's the strategy? The strategy is if you can take the data, and right now it's kind of a very raw functionality, but APIs allow this to happen, which is the ability for one software to talk to another software with permissions on what data sources. Connecting your point of truth data, your PMS system and or your online booking engine to your GA4 via a common data platform, in this case, data BigQuery, allows you to begin to track the two things you already do know, which is book, uh, booking date, arrival date, but you don't know them by their IDs in the sense of their actual transaction IDs. You only know them by the, what they did as activity on your site, your booking engine in particular. But now you can, in your system, look at who they are and also track your cancellations with the same identifier as to who they were when they booked in relationship to when they're arriving. And if they did cancel, exactly what transaction was canceled. The ability to do this, now there's a longhand way of doing that with just getting your confirmation cancellations uh, exported out and then compared to the confirmation cancellations of bookings versus the cancellations and then identifying them that way. But we need the data for a different reason. I'll explain that in just a moment. The idea that we now can understand the frame of the uh, booking date versus the arrival date, and then if there's any cancellation that were to occur, where that lands, that gives us a unique marketing opportunity for retention. When I mentioned the fact that 97%, if you have a 3% conversion, which is good, uh, don't enact or react, that's a whole marketing strategy into itself that you're trying to create a method of improving their conversions. That has cost factor to it. It's called customer acquisition cost, okay, uh, CAC. And that has a high number to it because you're basically spending money to churn out this, this leaky valve, 3% putting money towards it, knowing that only 3% of the people are actually going to, to benefit, you know, get uh, purchase and you benefit from their, their transaction. The customer retention cost, CRC, is much lower in the sense that they've already gone and booked with you. They've identified who they are. They've, they said they're willing to book with you, but through whatever circumstances have changed their mind. Some of them are unavoided when you can't change their mind because it was generally an issue that had to happen. The... CRC versus the CAC is fractional. It's, it's, let's just say 25% cost in relationship to it. So if you can keep any of your cancellations from canceling, that cost to do so is way less, as I said, roughly about 25% in general, compared to your customer acquisition cost of trying to find somebody new to replace them. With that in mind, knowing best when to talk to them to hopefully avert their cancellation for generic reasons. And what I mean by generic reasons of I booked three or four different hotels, not knowing which one I want. I'm not solidifying my decision and my hotel is on the block of consideration. And if I haven't done something to re-legitimize my value proposition to them or reaffirm what I'm willing to give them, then I might be on the block because some other property at some well-timed period offered something different or do what I'm about to suggest you do. And that solidified the relationship decision for them to be the one that they choose to stay with. The opportunity to know when to do that improves your retention cost. Because if I know that, well, they booked 48 days ahead of their arrival, now, I can spend 48 days reminding me how cool my resort is or my hotel is or how happy I am that they're showing up or whatever through the uh, communication mediums that they provided. If they give me their email for the booking, which they usually do, uh, the, all the, the typical things you know about with pre-arrival. The problem with static pre-arrival is it's static. X days beforehand, we get an email indicating, thank you, we're looking forward to you staying with us. Uh, make sure you don't miss this, this, and this. We very, very rarely uh, incentivize that as a reward for them staying with the decision to stay with us. And you may say, well, I already booked them. Why am I giving something more away to them? 
because you're creating the experience that you promised them for the duration of their engagement with you. And you forget to easily uh, take them for granted that they're just planning on staying with you. They booked with you. They're going to stay with you. And because of that, then you have the, the uh, surprise of why you have a cancellation. Why? Why they, you know, Okay. Well, it must have been bad weather, maybe. Why, and a very legitimate generic reason why people would go over and, and cancel. Um, there's ways around that. We had very successful campaigns in Keys uh, that I did that when we knew bad weather was going to happen on the weekend that we had heavy bookings already. We gave them a discount of drinks to the restaurant saying, hey, just in case you caught in our passing showers, no reason to ruin the weekend. Come on down anyway. And while we have to wait for the rain, we'll give you a drink to enjoy the time. That helped a lot. Uh, we, there was a very different, different benchmark before we did that to after we did that. Before we did that, we had a certain cancellation percentage. After we did that, it was a smaller number. Uh, didn't solve the world. People were still not like, hey, no, I'm not going to deal with it. I'll just pick another weekend when it's not going to be raining. You know. But for those people that didn't have that option of whatever reason, and it made it more palatable for them to continue to stay with you. Plus, also, uh, they appreciated the fact that you knew that they knew that you knew. So why not give them an incentive to be with you? That type of touching at timeliness is what keeps the conversions uh, high. Now, I'm going to pause that discussion for just a second. Uh, because I want to talk about com uh, cancellation percentages. One, I have not met anybody anywhere that has accurately told me their cancellation percentage for their hotel. Uh, historical, period over period, year over year, month in particular, year over, complete year to date, never close. And I mean, not within two, three, four percent, which would be close as in not in the ballpark. Uh, I found it very surprising because it's a, a very powerful number because it's a very leaky hole. If you look at just top line production, a channel like a OTA or a channel like your direct channel or a channel that is providing um, GDS, you know, whatever channel, and you say, oh, look, I have on the books $100,000 from OTA. No, you don't. You have it on the and to be correct, you do have it on the books. It's just not going to stay on the books. Um, OTAs have a, a really hard, tough cancellation percentage, uh, very high. The only times that it comes down exceptionally reasonably low is when it's such a high demand, maybe event driven or specific time slot that people were lucky to get the booking and they're not going to let it go. And that's not often. So when I mean by high, I mean high as in upper 30s, 40%. Uh, some places uh, historically that we had and uh, have clients in New York City, Midtown, uh, you could get upwards of 80% cancellation within 72 hours. Crazy numbers. And so what that meant that, you know, our example, if you had $100,000 from an OTA that you had on the books, uh, for a particular date span, you could account that 30 and upwards percent of that weren't going to materialize. Now, the typical strategy for a hotel is to overbook their situation, knowing that they have wash, which is a nice way of saying cancellations. They would overbook themselves to make sure that they had more people. Now, what does that do to you as a guest or as a guest or as an operator that has guests that you that you gambled and you lost? Now you have walks. You have to have a walk rate and have a place to walk them. And if you have that kind of demand, then most of your competitors don't have space for you to walk them to either. And that creates a very challenging situation that nobody likes. And usually front desk people, that's when they begin to despise revenue management strategies because the revenue manager isn't the one facing the guests to tell them as tired as they are, as late as it is, there's no place for them to sleep because even though they have a reservation, they don't have a room. And they wish the revenue manager was there when they're the ones that caused it. So. With that process, uh, telling you that people don't know their cancellation rates in general is true. Uh, I've got to come, as I said, anybody that knows it with an even sense of closeness of accuracy, which also means they have no perspective on their cancellations per channel. Now that has a factor of value, which we'll get to. Um, this goes hand in hand with another answer that I never get correctly from anybody. And I mean anybody with any sense of level of accuracy. 
and that is their channel contribution. What do I mean by that? How much of your top line revenue is of a particular channel, like an OTA channel, or maybe call it Expedia or hotels, or whatever, your direct channel, whatever the channels are that you have that produces top line revenue, how much of that, how, how much of that that contributes is a percentage of the entire amount. Nobody's close to that one either. They never truly understand who's feeding them. From a portion perspective, they know the channels are producing, but they don't have a, a relative perspective of how much in comparison to each of the channels. Then you add to the fact that they don't know what the cost per channel is at any given time. Another number most people don't know. And they don't know the cancellation percentage of each channel. So you basically are running blind with your strategy of you're dumping in baskets fulls of grapes, not knowing if they're getting ground into wine or just dumping into the dirt underneath of you. You don't know what the total actual production is from your top line production. I'm a huge advocate of KPIs when it comes to top line production. You need to have definitive goals. I need this channel to produce this much because in the scope of its percentage value to the other channels, um, I needed to make this much money. As a matter of fact, the budget calculators on the website, hospitalitydigitalmarketing.com, which I refer to doing our budget times of August and September and October, helps you understand that you first have to understand how much each channel is contributing. You can't put um, two tons worth of stuff on a Pinto. It'll crush it. You need a truck. Well, you can't expect your paid ad campaigns that only contribute 7% of your business to make up for 20% of your business that doesn't get produced by another channel because it didn't get fully funded correctly and or produced at a certain level. We had a wonderful show for show number 420. Uh, 10 weeks back that talked about stress testing your budget, where you literally modify your channel contribution percentages to see what other channels can compensate and how much based on their volume of opportunity. Uh, if you haven't got that, it was a fun show talking about stress testing your budget. This is to that kind of that exercise. So you need three very strong uh, numbers. One is your channel contribution. Second, your channel cancellations. Okay. And the third is your uh, channel cost. The idea with all these is to go to what we're talking about in the sense of using this data of cancellations. In each channel, and I said OTA is very high, direct channel is one of your lowest, obviously, and, and most lowest is your PMS or your direct walk ups and calls and so forth. Those people tend to be immediate. They made the choice, they're walking in your door, whatever it is. There's very light and likelihood they're going to walk away after making a reservation, changing their mind. So if you know when they've booked and you know when they're staying and through accurate data uh, connection to your uh, online booking engine, okay, then you know when the cancellations are related to those two dates as well. For each cancel, for each revenue, not just in general, although that's even helpful, but actually here's your revenue stream of reservations as they're approaching their arrival dates. And then you have your cancellation drops according to those reservations. You begin to see trends and patterns pretty quickly. You see that um, usually within 48 to 72 hours prior to arrival, you have a cancellation cycle. Usually you have a cancellation of three to five days from a booking cycle. And then you have depending upon the type of, of duration of booking window, you have a mid hump, which is where people have finally gone past the first one. They've made a bunch of reservations perhaps, and they put it to rest and they're doing other things. And once they solidify their trip and maybe get their plane tickets or whatever it is that was holding them up and then coming back to the hotel decision, gleaning out the ones that they don't want because they multiple booked. That usually happens within about 14 days and less depends of the actual arrival date. So, Knowing this allows you, because you have the information from them, to know when best to engage with them to ensure that you're the one that they select. Now, certain selection cancellations cannot be corrected for. Um, change in plans, tragedies, uh, change in the qualifier of their travel, whether it's a business travel, whether it's a um, leisure travel, whether it's family visit, whether it's a holiday visit. If the plan changes, they, they, they just cancel. Those are the unavoidables. There is a recapture value to them, though, that we'll talk about. 
But those are the ones you can't affect with what we're talking about right now. But for the other ones that were multiple books, flex books, option books, whatever way you want to phrase them, those are the people that you can remind them and or augment them with the value of making sure that you're the one that they that they keep as their reservation. Maybe when you look at um, why they're booking, if it's event driven, if it's seasonal driven, if they depending upon what they looked at on your website as to events and or content and or amenities uh, and or the duration of their stay can be an influencer. The beauty part of GA4 is you can create all custom segments from this. So you can tailor somebody that was going to stay with you over a weekend for three days that was uh, 30 days out from their booking window. And you can see from their data that geographically they were going to be flying, which means that at the two week mark, they had to make the finalization of their flights because they need at least flights two weeks out because then the prices go skewy. So you see that they didn't cancel three to five days after they made the initial booking. So now what you're looking at is they we know they're coming because they're flying. We need to make sure that they don't choose between us and somebody else, that the cancellation doesn't happen. So we want to engage them with CRM, customer relationship management, emails, communications that reaffirm the excitement that we have for their arrival, typical stuff we do, highlighting some things that they've expressed interest in, which is the segmentation of their engagement with our audience, and or incentive values to remind them is like, when you get here, you know what, since you're on your way soon, We'd love to make the first drink on us at the bar or the first snack or the get your welcome amenity. It looks like you haven't been with us before. Imagine that you actually look and find out the person never stayed with you or just the inverse. Hey, thanks for being back. That personalization CRM engagement changes that cancellation that you were just one of the two or three resorts that they were ready to make a decision on where they're eventually going to land because you're all kind of side by side to each other. It was really just about rates and dates, room types, reviews, whatever the various criteria the individual um, reservations guests have. You're superseding that dialogue with reminding them things that you want them to be thankful for, for having decided to have booked with you and most importantly, to stay with you. If you can reduce that cancellation percentage that your channel has for that. Even 1%. The cost, is, again, is incremental. Cost retention, the customer retention cost versus customer uh, acquisition cost, radically different. Okay? And with that, you have the ability to solidify the durability of the reservation and count on it so you don't have a bleed where you now have to start overbooking and creating your own scenarios or problems. The value proposition is very strong. Now, Going back to these channel contributions and cancellations and so forth. Um, I brought this up when budget season first started, and we've talked about it every budget season for the past three years. And blissfully, we can honestly, you know, we're in our 10th year of doing the live show every week. So we get to hammer details year in and year out about things. And one of these is knowing your bleed factor about cancellations in relationship to your budget. Because you count on looking at a channel and say, okay, let's just be general. Your direct channel represents 30%. Your website represents 30% of your top line revenue. Good. Okay. And your cost of acquisition for your website based on uh, your budget and your click through um, percentage, your, your conversions. Okay. That you have a cost per acquisition for, uh, um, each guest, you have a cost per click is what's used to create that. And if you don't know the math, it's really simple. You pay a cost per click for everybody that clicks on your site, but only 3% of them book. So you apply the entire cost of what you spent to get that 3% to buy something and you apply it to that to the people that converted. So that if you spent $100 and three out of 100 people end up buying $1,000, your cost of acquisition was 10%. So that's how you base it on that. Now, if your cost of acquisition is, is, is 10%, then that means that you only have 90% of the monies that that person walked in the door with to apply to everything about their stay, their flow through. So obviously that can be a very high number. Um, it depends on your math, it depends on your budget, it depends on what your goals are, occupancy versus ADR, so forth. But that's how you calculate those things. So you're looking at uh, your direct channel, 30% contribution, and say you have a 10% cost. Okay. If you have a 25% cancellation 
that affects both of those numbers. One, you won't get the thousand dollars. You only get seven hundred fifty dollars because twenty five percent of the people are going to cancel. And your cost of acquisition isn't the ten percent. It's actually twenty five percent more. So it affects your cost of acquisition for the people that did stay. And it affects your ability of top line production of that channel for those that did cancel. Cancellations are a part of our industry, but they don't have to be such a large part of the industry. Now, each channel you approach differently in strategy. Direct channel, you have much more influence, much more opportunity to directly dialogue with the guest. OTA channels, on the other hand, you have a very limited capacity to engage with the guest. Yes, third parties can give you a ability, a made up email address to communicate fundamental communications as they refer to it. And that is pre-arrival information and or value propositions on, upon their arrival uh, and some review functionality or post stay communication, but very limited. You have to pay for the privilege basically. That means that you have very little opportunity to help convert that channel. So your answer to helping slow down the cancellations to that channel is reduce your reliance on that channel as a top line contributor because you have less control over mitigating the customer retention of that channel. All said and same, you should exercise every opportunity that's available in your third parties to keep them. You should find every opportunity to not have the third party channel be the most prominent contribution to your top line, which is always an unpleasant surprise for people when I show them their real numbers. Uh, they will say, oh, we're no more than 20% contribution for OTA when they're almost 40. And well, that's that month. No, it's for your year to date. And actually, when looking at your previous year, you went up, not down. So, you know, and we're maybe down by one or two points. It is a, it is a constant contributor, large contributor percentage, and very few uh, properties that I have had personally had the privilege of dealing with have low OTAs. One of our biggest claims is we had a client in Canada that we went from them having 40%, and this took almost four years to do this, to being less than 7%, because we literally focused on what we're talking about, CRM engagement, personalization, direct communication, direct offers, and limited our exposure on the OTAs in that process. Yes, we could be found for those that are adamantly using the OTAs, but even in that case, and that's what the time duration it took, in their engagement with us, we highlighted the huge value of direct engagement with us for any frequency they had back, for any reason they were coming to the market that we were in. We constantly created the relationships, the advocacies to drive them to want to deal with us directly rather than using the third party that brought them there initially. So all of this process um, through the topic of channel cancellation data to boost top line revenue is to understand the number of metrics related to the channels themselves, their total contribution, their cancellation, and their cost. Those factors are key elements to a strategy, which means that when you're looking at stress testing your budget as to what channels produce what, because that's usually where we run into problems. We anticipated our paid campaigns to produce X amount of money, at X percentage of cost. And when that doesn't work, and the worst part is even more money doesn't help it, we have to find out how to augment the loss of that channel's top line contribution with other channels that might have the opportunity to do so. That's the stress testing of a budget, is to determine if this channel isn't producing at the levels we need it to, what other channels can fill that gap, pick the ball up with it, so to speak. Not all channels can. What happens, unfortunately, is marketers, more importantly, revenue managers and, and the authorities above them, get lazy and they dump inventory into the hardest channel to get it back from, and that is the OTAs. We can't do it for ourselves or we restricted our budget too much for whatever BS reasons we did it for. So let's just go in the commission pure model of like, you know, we're not going to pay for it unless it gets produced. So let's just push the hell out. We'll do ads in Expedia. We'll do ads on other stuff and uh, on other OTAs and just have them do the heavy lifting of spending the marketing to have people come to us. The detriment is, and we've had shows on this, uh, for show number 418 and 419 about lifetime value. We talked about the fact that that is the worst thing for you to do because where you um, 
uh, saved a penny today, you lost a dollar later because now you have no direct communication with them and your property, unless they're very active in converting them once they get to the property, which properties that can do this strategy and I say it's okay to do it are the ones that, yeah, we don't have the budget to do it. This is the only resource we had that could try to drive business for us. We know we're expanding our OTA contribution, but we need the business. So we're allowing that to happen where we're doing that. But we have a very active on property campaign to convert those people so that the second opportunity with those guests will be direct with us. For those hotels that have that strategy, it's okay to do this to a certain degree. I wouldn't do it all the time. I wouldn't make it their marketing de facto. I would simply go over and say, at, when you need that gap and you don't have the, the ability to do it yourself through lack of audience size or budgets or whatever, then yes, go to that and ride the coattails of the third parties. Other than that, I've very rarely seen hotels do the conversion well. You ask all the hotels and they think that they're doing well. I love asking revenue managers who sit in their office, how are you guys doing on channel shifting your guests from the OTAs into your job? Oh, we're great. We're, we get 70% uh, capture emails. Hmm. 80%, 90%. We're nine out of 10 people at our front desk we know where they booked from, and we know that they, we have the information that we can direct book them. That is amazing. Until I see what they do with it, which is usually nothing. And if they do do something with it, it's usually blunted. We've had our discussions about newsletters that are shotgunned out for anybody that we have an email address without little affair to personalization, little affair to creating segmentation of engagement with that same said newsletter. We've had those discussions about how it's proudful for somebody in the back office to say, we're getting 50, 60, 80, 90% conversion in emails from people from other channels that we didn't have control over. But I have literally, I probably on one hand can count the, the clients that I've dealt with that actually did well with that data. And even then you have the people that signed up with fake emails just to get you off their back or to get the free bottle of water you offer to get it. Um, and or the email that they used would be one that uh, gets transitioned out. It's a business email or something that they no longer use, or they certainly don't take information off of. They just give you an email to let it know to go to junk. Or um, they don't longer have interest in the unsubscribe to you. They, they immediately unsubscribe when you first send to them because it was just the modality of getting whatever you offered to get the email and they had no interest in continuation. They didn't want the junk or you abused it by sending them too much stuff and they had to cancel to get you off their back. Any which way, all of that happens on a regular basis in our industry. Sad to say. So uh, if you're taking solstice into the fact that you're capturing those emails from alternate channels and you're dedicating a high percentage of contribution from the OTAs to do that, I'd say I call BS on that because I don't think it's done well. And the people that do it well realize they don't want to do it. It's kind of like somebody that knows martial arts or something. Last thing they want to do is get in a fight. If you know what the challenges of getting that retention through an OTA channel and the cost to get that business and the lifetime cost, lifetime value of the guest by getting a direct channel and knowing that what that value really means to be able to communicate with that guest directly and the fact that you don't have to repetitively pay those commissions to a third party to keep retaining the guest, the last place you want to get business from is from the OTAs. That doesn't mean the OTAs can't be useful. I'm working on a, a process right now where I'm thinking with the ability of our attracting, we have a hard time, anybody has a hard time, but and we have a hard time um, assigning OTA traffic through our website. Unless they touch something on our website and we know that they came from an OTA, we really don't have a way of identifying the engagement of those people to uh, create custom segments to convince them to come direct channel versus using the OTA that they discovered us on. The best way to do that is what I propose is that you do an ad campaign specifically ahead of a high demand time that you're doing with an OTA to drive traffic to your direct channel offering which allows you to create a custom audience from that engagement that you then can expand to a lookalike audience beyond that of people that are of the same like of looking for whatever it is you're offering during your peak demand period. So basically riding on the coattails of OTA to get the traffic interest that they generate for your own means of direct channel communication. I'll let you know how that goes in the coming weeks when we, we try that for the holiday season. So the idea of Knowing when people arrive, knowing obviously when they're staying with us, but more importantly, knowing when they have their going to their cancellation cycle opportunity and being in front of them to reaffirm their purchase choice decision with us. If it is for a reason that we can compensate for other than, you know, the tragedies that do create legitimate cancellations, even said same with that, I would take our cancellations and incentivize them on a return. We noticed that you canceled with us. We're so sorry. Your plans had changed. 
Um, here's something to entice you to come back with us the next time you should choose to find that uh, we're a consideration for you. That helps so much because that effort just to do that while you have the chance to do that means that the next time that they're going to come to your market, your destination, they have a get out of jail free card for you of like, well, hey, that hotel, didn't they offer me a discount or a percentage? They might save it somewhere to know that, well, I'm not going to do it now. And only they know when they're going to come back to you. So it'll be like, okay, I'm going to remind myself, you know, X months from now when I know I'm going to have to go back there. I got this, this thing that says, hey, when you book again, you'll get this. Why isn't people doing that more often? This The cost of doing that is fractional to having to rediscover them again in future tenses. Or not, not that you wouldn't do engagement between now and then anyway, but your frequency is going to be a lot lower because they've already not decided to go with you. So you're not going to hammer them on this multiple frequency retargeting campaign. As a matter of fact, you should take your cancellations out of the retargeting so that you don't badger them. You know what? Note to self. I haven't done that yet. I haven't taken my cancellations out of my segmentations as a contrast. Well, I just thought of something I need to do. Um, that would allow me to segment them to a different communication stream related to what they initially were interested in with an offer that they hope they could redeem on their second consideration with us. Now, you may say, well, people are going to exploit that. They're, when they realize you're giving away something, when they cancel, they're just going to book, cancel, get what they offered, and then rebook again. Okay. <laughs> sure. For the people that do that, smart them, bad us. Um, I don't think that would be a proportion that you would worry about, number one. So in the political arguments of, see, I told you that would happen. Yeah, okay, sure. And how much damage is that doing to us? And if it is doing that much damage to us, then we can modify what we're giving them for the cancellation in the hopes that they re rebook to modify the, the, the negative impact on us. So that argument doesn't get won by anybody that just wants to be a naysayer. The idea that you can take the cancellations, take them out of your retargeting stream, put them into a different flow, incentivize them for a rebook, obviously, with a conditional formatting that the value of the rebook diminishes over time. So... If you book rebook with us within 90 days, it's worth a higher value than if you book with us within six months. But there's still a residual value even for the duration of a year. So even if they don't think they're going to rebook immediately, and this would be dependent upon what they canceled for. If this is a resort and it's for an event, I don't think doing a 90 day high value, 60 day or, or uh, six month low value, lower value, 12 months lowest value would work because obviously they can't, we're coming for a holiday or an event and that doesn't happen, but seasonally. So penalizing them for not rebooking soon doesn't really benefit you. But if it's just for general en engagement, um, then it's an incentive to say, Hey, look, you didn't make it this time, but I hope you're coming back real soon. If so, we're going to be able to give you this much more if you do. Um, interesting. And I think I've done something similar to it in times past, but now with the new data in GA4, I think there's going to be a whole new level of granularity to it that's going to be a benefit. Well, um, Mind of Mencina, you just literally saw me blink on a flickering light bulb of an idea of something I haven't done that I should do. So uh, by all means, take it. Uh, if, you, if you're at the level that you can use it, then please do. I applaud you. Um, yeah. So anyways, the idea of having cancellations, both as a date stamp compared to the actual reservation versus arrival, allows you to target the opportunity to do retention for them. It reduces your cost. Customer retention cost is way lower than customer acquisition cost. Um, the ability to then create that as a tangible engagement with them, like we just discovered for segmenting them out in the, in, in the sense that even those people that cancel for legitimate reasons or whatever reasons they consider to be legitimate, you're still wanting to acquire them back at a lower cost because of an incentive value that you gave them. Take Okay, take my example. If I went over and had a, a acquisition cost of $100 per person on a stay, and that represents 10%, then if I gave them a 15, 20% coupon off of whatever they're going to be staying at, future tense, okay, uh, say it's 20%, then and, their, and the reservation was worth 500 bucks, then that's 50 bucks off. That's half of what I had to pay to get them in the first place. Think of it that way. So, yes, I'm actually I'm, I'm adding to my to-do list today. I'm literally going to go back, resegment out 
my cancellations that I'm drawing data from that didn't, when, because we're going to, any cancellation is going to be in the, the, first off, we don't want them to cancel. That's our first CRM engagement. We want to re-engage with them in the, in the cycles that we know that we have the highest opportunity of them potentially canceling as to stopping them from canceling. Should they still cancel? Um, always try to find out because it's always good to know why the reasons are, whether if they're truthful or not, but at least you'll get some sense of, of pur purpose to that. If they're willing to share it, don't push, but ask. Um, the Dutch have a saying, help you, yake, ikraiken, which is, you know, no, I already have. So if you don't ask, you already have an answer. If you should ask and they still don't want to answer, no difference. So the idea that if and still they cancel, um, send the regret letter. So sorry that that happened and everything like that. And depending upon the cancellation, which is really a sensitive CRM control issue, if it's just a general cancellation, give them the diminishing value um, rebook va um, offer. If it's a event driven or holiday driven thing, I wouldn't take those dates and say anybody that cancels for these dates, we simply want to offer them a 12 month durable offer for rebook. Hopefully at next year, the time that they're going to come back, whatever. Uh, but for the same dates, you can actually qualify by saying, we're so sorry that you are not going to be joining us for Christmas. But should you want to join us again next year, this offer is valid for the blank dates that we have offered for Christmas next year. Should you want to exercise the option or rebook now and we'll apply it right now for next year. Mm, another one I got to add there. See, brains are turning, things are happening. Anywho, um, off on a little bit of a tangent on changing my CRM strategies, but uh, you witnessed the process of discovery in its own little simple little voice way in my head. Um, thank you all so very much for taking the journey with me today, going through the process, our discussion, obviously, of cancellation data in relationship to your channels for top line revenue. Uh, exactly saying using channel cancellation data to boost your top line revenue. That was the topic for today. We talked about segmentations. I would strongly recommend that you understand your channel contribution percentages. I think I would strongly recommend and, and the variations of it per cycle of month or season, weekends versus weekdays. It's great knowledge to have because any number that's thrown at you as to production, you can immediately dilute it to a more accurate number of what the real number is. Um, the cost of the cancellation percentage, obviously, of those channels in particular, and the cost of those channels to always know that OTAs cost you the percentage of commission, to always know that you, the website is the channel of transaction cost, your GDS, your GDS cost, those kind of things. So, I will say that properties do know GDS costs and they do know that usually the commission cost. Actually, that's not true. I'm amazed at the strange, sorry, small tangent on this one. So, uh, I can ask revenue managers, so what's it costing you to get the Expedia booking? Well, we're on a special commission model. Really, what's that? Well, we only pay 12%. Really? So all the, you should do contract work for all the big brands because they don't do that. They don't have that. How did you get 12% when everybody else is 18, 16, 15 at best? How does it you get 12%? Well, we're, our, our ownership group negotiated that. Now, what they did do was that they promised to spend X amount of money. And in that spending of the money of advertisement on that channel, they were given a reduced commission for the incentive promotion that was being spent on. So you pay 18, 20% commission on a regular basis, bread and butter days. If you're going to give Expedia money to promote you, the promotion code that you give them for that promoted effort that you're spending promoted money on, you get a reduced commission on. Not always, but less, it's a negotiated thing you can get and say it's 12%. So for that promotion that you're spending extra money on to put on a channel that you have to pay commission on, you're only paying 12%. What isn't mathed out and what you would think revenue managers being math people would understand is that OTA is still laughing at them because the money it took for you to spend to get that reduced in commission when added together, is more money than you spend if you didn't pay for the for the, the promotion at all. Because you're literally paying them to take more business out of your direct channel, and you're still paying, albeit a smaller commission compared to what the, money, the regular commission is, on top of that. But when you add those two numbers together, you actually spent more money. But they're very proud of the fact that they just hammered on the blah, 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 12% when blah, blah, blah. Oh, we're only paying 12%. Whoa, no, you're not. You're paying 12% when you're giving them more money to build business for you. And the sad part of it is, is that it doesn't necessarily drive more business to you because it just means you're more visible in comparison to your competitors, but you're still being put in comparison to your competitors. Because as is always said by a friend of mine, Dean Schmidt, or a meta search person, is Expedia is not out to sell a room at your hotel. They're out to sell a room. 
It can be at your hotel. So whether it gets bought at your hotel or through your extra payment efforts, people discovered other hotels because they had to find your hotel, but you were in comparison to other hotels and they saw another hotel that they liked better for whatever reason, you just paid for that benefit of not getting money off of it. And then you paid for the benefit, even if they did book with you, that wonderful, what you think is your regular commission rate isn't. So strange how a little bit of knowledge gets warped into a thing. And then it turns into a point of truth because the revenue manager said it. So that must be what we're doing. And then when anybody actually goes back and looks at the contract, they're like, that 12% is only when we spend X thousands of dollars on an ad and only from the production of that ad. We're paying this commission. And by the way, as a little word of note, it's nice to think that the, the world is truthful and accurate when it comes to these things. When you get the statement of report of production from an OTA, please make sure your accounting office is actually confirming those cancellations to actualized cancellations. We talked about percentage of variances. There are lots of times, lots of times, where um, you're being charged for a, a reservation that was canceled. But because of the time it was canceled versus the reporting or, and, or just sometimes mathematical errors, sometimes it doesn't get recorded correctly. Also, too, and, <clears throat> and this is a big deal, uh, if you don't already have in your, in your contract with the uh, uh, OTAs or travel agents or consortiums or anybody else, that any booking in a group book that is done via their channel, you do not pay for. So if, in fact, they take credit for having been a part of a booking process that ended up being a group booking, group coded booking, you need to make sure that those get taken out. You would be surprised how often you're paying commission on bookings that were done on your negotiated bookings, on your group, on your group bookings. We're going to have a whole couple of shows next year, uh, late spring, talking about when you sit to the table with the renewal of your contracts with your OTAs, so many people do not know what they're doing and they're too embarrassed to ask. So they end up doing whatever the contract says and they don't know that they should negotiate things like last room sell, uh, always available, those kind of things that you can truly go. You know, uh, it's another thing I talked to revenue managers and like, oh, we shut OTAs off. You can't. Your contract requires you to always have an availability for them, last room available. And or even if you shut off third party availability for them, they can pull it through GDS. You're still paying. Anyways, lots of stories and things to over that. Um, with all of that, my name is Lauren Gray. I thank you, as always, for watching us on our TV channel, Hospitality Channel, on uh, Amazon TV, uh, with the Fire Kindle and so forth, Google TV, Apple TV Plus. Um, uh, what I miss? Uh, Google, Amazon, Apple, um, Roku. Uh, all the smart TVs, LG, Samsung, so forth. Just look at the hospitality channel. The live show is always on the free side. There's plenty of data, uh, data on the back side of that. It's like a monthly subscription to get hospitality content data, product uh, showcases, uh, learning uh, programs, so forth, are all on the back side of that. If you're a hospitality marketing professional, you can join our hospitality marketing club for free uh, for the rest of this year uh, at hospitalitymarketing.club. Uh, put your email in. I send you a quiz. If you pass the quiz, uh, it shows you have uh, working proficiency in hospitality marketing. We're not there to teach basics for people. We're people that are already doing this work and need a peer group to communicate with. We do uh, live Q&A. We do live, show, uh, live presentations uh, from multiple people behind it, uh, which is a lot of fun, uh, very insightful, and a good chance to ask open questions about stuff, about doing these things that we talk about, where a lot of stuff this content comes from, actually. Um, then, of course, our, our podcasts, we do, um, uh, like I said, I'm 30, in 39 countries and 39 channels as well. Uh, we're going to do a quick recap. It's a little smaller uh, uh, time than this one. We do usually about 15, 20, uh, 20 to 30 minutes is our, our podcast times. We recap, but more importantly, we get granular about tools that we use and the techniques of using those tools related to some of what we're talking about today. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, reporting tools, garnering tools, and creating CRM interfaces and so forth a little bit today. Kind of geek out on that a little bit. Um, all said and done, we have hospitalityradio.com, um, which you can catch all of ours and every other hospitality industry uh, podcast that is of good caliber on there. We have uh, Revenue Management Hour. We have Sales Hour. We have MetaSearch Hour. We have Marketing Hour, which is mine. Um, and we rotate through all of that on a scheduled basis. So 1 o'clock is always marketing hours, um, Monday through Friday, so forth kind of thing. And then we do have our I Love Lucy recap Ray Run uh, platform, uh, which is at hospitalitychannel.tv. There you can watch all of our live shows. Uh, based on broadcast date, uh, guest uh, 
um, guest appearance and or also topic. Um, also, if you want to see our app, we have it on Apple iOS and Google Play, just look for Hospitality Channel. There you'll see our TV channel uh, that as well. So again, thank you for the privilege of your time. My name is Long Gray, and I look forward to talking to you all next week.